Chapter sixty of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by Francis Jenkins Olcott. Prince Sherry. Long ago there lived a monarch who was such a very honest man that his subjects entitled him the Good King. One day, when he was out hunting, a little white rabbit, which had been half killed by his hounds, leaped right into his majesty's arms. Said he, caressing it, This poor creature has put itself under my protection, and I will allow no one to injure it. So he carried it to his palace, had prepared for it a neat little rabbit hutch, with abundance of the daintiest food, such as rabbits love, and there he left it. The same night, when he was alone in his chamber, there appeared to him a beautiful lady, she was dressed neither in gold nor silver nor brocade but her flowing robes were white as snow and she wore a garland of white roses on her head the good king was greatly astonished at the sight for his door was locked and he wondered how so dazzling a lady could possibly enter but she soon removed his doubts i am the fairy candid said she with a smiling and gracious air passing through the wood where you were hunting i took a desire to know if you were as good as men say you are I therefore changed myself into a white rabbit, and sought refuge in your arms. You saved me, and now I know that those who are merciful to dumb beasts will be ten times more so to human beings. You merit the name your subjects give you. You are the good king. I thank you for your protection, and shall be always one of your best friends. You have but to say what you most desire, and I promise you your wish shall be granted. Madam, replied the king, if you are a fairy you must know without my telling you the wish of my heart i have one well-beloved son prince sherry whatever kind feeling you have toward me extend it to him willingly said candid i will make him the handsomest richest or most powerful prince in the world choose whichever you desire for him none of the three returned the father i only wish him to be good the best prince in the world of what use would riches power or beauty be to him if he were a bad man you are right said the fairy but i cannot make him good he must do that himself i can only change his external fortunes for his personal character the utmost i can promise is to give good counsel reprove him for his faults and even punish him if he will not punish himself you mortals can do the same with your children ah yes said the king sighing Still, he felt that the kindness of a fairy was something gained for his son, and died not long after, content and at peace. Prince Sherry mourned deeply, for he dearly loved his father, and would have gladly given all his kingdoms and treasures to keep him in life a little longer. Two days after the good king was no more, Prince Sherry was sleeping in his chamber, when he saw the same dazzling vision of the fairy candid. "'I promised your father,' said she, "'to be your best friend.' and in pledge of this take what i now give you and she placed a small gold ring upon his finger poor as it looks it is more precious than diamonds for whenever you do ill it will prick your finger if after that warning you still continue in evil you will lose my friendship and i shall become your direst enemy so saying she disappeared leaving sherry in such amazement that he would have believed it all a dream save for the ring on his finger he was for a long time so good that the ring never pricked him at all, and this made him so cheerful and pleasant in his humour that everybody called him Happy Prince Sherry. But one unlucky day he was out hunting and found no sport, which vexed him so much that he showed his ill temper by his looks and ways. He fancied his ring felt very tight and uncomfortable, but as it did not prick him, he took no heed of this, until, re-entering his palace, his little pet dog, Bibi, jumped up upon him, and was sharply told to get away the creature accustomed to nothing but caresses tried to attract his attention by pulling at his garments when prince chéri turned and gave it a severe kick at this moment he felt in his finger a prick like a pin what nonsense said he to himself the fairy must be making game of me why what great evil have i done i the master of a great empire cannot i kick my own dog a voice replied or else prince sherry imagined it no sire the master of a great empire has a right to do good but not evil i a fairy 
am as much above you as you are above your dog i might punish you kill you if i chose but i prefer leaving you to amend your ways you have been guilty of three faults to-day bad temper passion cruelty do better to-morrow the prince promised and he kept his word a while but he had been brought up by a foolish nurse who indulged him in every way and was always telling him that he would be a king one day when he might do as he liked in all things he found out now that even a king cannot always do that it vexed him and made him angry his ring began to prick him so often that his little finger was continually bleeding he disliked this as was natural and soon began to consider whether it would not be easier to throw the wing away altogether than to be constantly annoyed by it it was such a queer thing for a king to have always a spot of blood on his finger at last unable to put up with it any more he took his ring off and hid it where he would never see it and believed himself the happiest of men for he could now do exactly what he liked he did it and became every day more and more miserable one day he saw a young girl so beautiful that being always accustomed to have his own way he immediately determined to marry her he never doubted that she would be only too glad to be made a queen for she was very poor but zelia that was her name answered to his great astonishment that she would rather not marry him do i displease you asked the prince into whose mind it had never entered that he could displease anybody not at all my prince said the honest peasant maiden you are very handsome very charming but you are not like your father the good king i will not be your queen for you would make me miserable at these words the prince's love seemed all to turn to hatred he gave orders to his guards to convey zelia to a prison near the palace and then took counsel with his foster brother the one of all his ill companions who most incited him to do wrong sir said this man if i were in your majesty's place i would never vex myself about a poor silly girl feed her on bread and water till she comes to her senses and if she still refuses you let her die in torment as a warning to your other subjects should they venture to dispute your will you will be disgraced should you suffer yourself to be conquered by a simple girl but said prince sherry shall i not be disgraced if i harm a creature so perfectly innocent no one is innocent who disputes your majesty's authority said the courtier bowing and it is better to commit an injustice than allow it to be supposed you can ever be contradicted with impunity this touched Chéri on his weak point his good impulses faded he resolved once more to ask zelia if she would marry him and if she again refused to sell her as a slave arrived at the cell in which she was confined what was his astonishment to find her gone he knew not whom to accuse for he had kept the key in his pocket the whole time at last the foster brother suggested that the escape of celia might have been contrived by an old man suleiman by name the prince's former tutor who was the only one who now ventured to blame him for anything that he did cherry sent immediately and ordered his old friend to be brought to him loaded heavily with irons then full of fury he went and shut himself up in his own chamber where he went raging to and fro till startled by a noise like a clap of thunder the fairy candid stood before him prince said she in a severe voice i promised your father to give you good counsels and to punish you if you refused to follow them my counsels were forgotten my punishments despised under the figure of a man you have been no better than the beast you chase like a lion in fury a wolf in gluttony a serpent in revenge and a bull in brutality take therefore in your new form the likeness of all these animals scarcely had prince jerry heard these words than to his horror he found himself transformed into what the fairy had named he was a creature with the head of a lion the horns of a bull the feet of a wolf and the tail of a serpent at the same time he felt himself transported to a distant forest where standing on the bank of a stream he saw reflected in the water his own frightful shape and heard a voice saying look at thyself and know thy soul has become a thousand times uglier even than thy body sherry recognized the voice of candid and in his rage would have sprung upon her and devoured her but he saw nothing and the same voice said behind him cease thy feeble fury and learn to conquer thy pride by being in submission to thine own subjects 
hearing no more he soon quitted the stream hoping at least to get rid of the sight of himself but he had scarcely gone twenty paces when he tumbled into a pitfall that was laid to catch bears the bear hunters descending from some trees hard by caught him chained him and only too delighted to get hold of such a curious-looking animal led him along with them to the capital of his own kingdom there great rejoicings were taking place and the bear hunters asking what it was all about were told that it was because prince sherry the torment of his subjects had been struck dead by a thunderbolt just punishment of all his crimes four courtiers his wicked companions had wished to divide his throne among them but the people had risen up against them and offered the crown to suleiman the old tutor whom sherry had ordered to be arrested all this the poor monster heard he even saw suleiman sitting upon his own throne and trying to calm the populace by representing to them that it was not certain prince sherry was dead that he might return one day to reassume with honour the crown which suleiman only consented to wear as a sort of viceroy i know his heart said the honest and faithful old man it is tainted but not corrupt if alive he may reform yet and be all his father over again to you his people whom he has caused to suffer so much these words touched the poor beast so deeply that he ceased to beat himself against the iron bars of the cage in which the hunters carried him about became gentle as a lamb and suffered himself to be taken quietly to a menagerie where were kept all sorts of strange and ferocious animals a place which he himself often visited as a boy but never thought he should be shut up there himself however he owned he had deserved it all and began to make amends by showing himself very obedient to his keeper this man was almost as great a brute as the animals he had charge of and when he was in ill humour he used to beat them without rhyme or reason one day while he was sleeping a tiger broke loose and leaped upon him eager to devour him cherry at first felt the thrill of pleasure at the thought of being revenged then seeing how helpless the man was he wished himself free that he might defend him immediately the doors of his cage opened the keeper waking up saw the strange beast leap out and imagined of course that he was going to be slain at once instead he saw the tiger lying dead and the strange beast creeping up and laying itself at his feet to be caressed but as he lifted up his hand to stroke it a voice was heard saying good actions never go unrewarded and instead of the frightful monster there crouched on the ground nothing but a pretty little dog cherry delighted to find himself thus transformed caressed the keeper in every possible way till at last the man took him up into his arms and carried him to the king to whom he related this wonderful story from beginning to end the queen wished to have the charming little dog and cherry would have been exceedingly happy could he have forgotten that he was originally a man and a king he was lodged most elegantly had the richest of collars to adorn his neck and heard himself praised continually but his beauty rather brought him into trouble for the queen afraid lest he might grow too large for a pet took advice of dog doctors who ordered that he should be fed entirely upon bread and that very sparingly so poor sherry was sometimes nearly starved one day when they gave him his crust for breakfast a fancy seized him to go and eat in the palace garden so he took the bread in his mouth and trotted away towards a stream which he knew and where he sometimes stopped to drink but instead of the stream he saw a splendid palace glittering with gold and precious stones entering the doors was a crowd of men and women magnificently dressed and within there was singing and dancing and good cheer of all sorts yet however grandly and gaily the people went in sherry noticed that those who came out were pale thin ragged half naked covered with wounds and sores some of them dropped dead at once others dragged themselves on in a little way and then lay down dying of hunger and vainly begged a morsel of bread from others who were entering in who never took the least notice of them cherry perceived one woman who was trying feebly to gather and eat some green herbs poor thing he said to himself i know what it is to be hungry and i want my breakfast badly enough but still it will not kill me to wait till dinner-time and my crust may save the life of this poor woman so the little dog ran up to her and dropped his bread at her feet she picked it up and ate it with avidity soon she looked quite recovered and cherry delighted was trotting back again to his kennel when he heard loud cries and saw a young girl dragged by four men to the door of the palace which they were trying to compel her to enter 
oh how he wished himself a monster again as when he slew the tiger for the young girl was no other than his beloved Celia. alas what could a poor little dog do to defend her but he ran forward and barked at the men and bit their heels until at last they chased him away with heavy blows and then he lay down outside the palace door determined to watch and see what had become of Celia. conscience pricked him now what he thought i am furious against these wicked men who are carrying her away and did i not do the same myself did i not cast her into prison and intend to sell her as a slave who knows how much more wickedness i might not have done to her and others if heaven's justice had not stopped me in time while he lay thinking and repenting he heard a window open and saw zelia throw out of it a bit of dainty meat sherry who felt hungry enough by this time was just about to eat it when the woman to whom he had given his crust snatched him up in her arms poor little beast cried she patting him every bit of food in that palace is poisoned you shall not touch a morsel and at the same time the voice in the air repeated again good actions never go unrewarded and cherry found himself changed into a beautiful little white pigeon he remembered with joy that white was the colour of the fairy candid and began to hope that she was taking him into favour again so he stretched his wings delighted that he might now have a chance of approaching his fair zelia he flew up to the palace windows and finding one of them open entered and sought everywhere but he could not find zelia then in despair he flew out again resolved to go over the world until he beheld her once more he took flight at once and traversed many countries swiftly as a bird can but found no trace of his beloved at length in a desert sitting beside an old hermit in his cave and partaking with him of his frugal repast cherry saw a poor peasant girl and recognized Celia. transported with joy he flew in perched on her shoulder and expressed his delight and affection by a thousand caresses she charmed with the pretty little pigeon caressed it in her turn and promised it that if it would stay with her she would love it always what have you done Celia? said the hermit smiling and while he spoke the white pigeon vanished and there stood prince chéri in his own natural form your enchantment ended prince when Celia promised to love you indeed she has loved you always but your many faults constrained her to hide her love these are now amended and you may both live happy if you will because your union is founded upon mutual esteem sherry and zelia threw themselves at the feet of the hermit whose form also began to change his soiled garments became of dazzling whiteness and his long beard and withered face grew into the flowing hair and lovely countenance of fairy candid rise up my children said she i must now transport you to your palace and restore to prince sherry his father's crown of which he is now worthy she had scarcely ceased speaking when they found themselves in the chamber of suleiman who delighted to find again his beloved pupil and master willingly resigned the throne and became the most faithful of his subjects king sherry and queen zelia reigned together for many years and it is said that the former was so blameless and strict in all his duties that though he constantly wore the ring which candid had restored to him it never once pricked his finger enough to make it bleed madame le prince de beaumont after miss mulock end of chapter sixty chapter sixty one the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by thomas rose the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud by francis jenkins olcott chapter sixty one toads and diamonds once upon a time there was a widow who had two daughters the elder was so exactly like her mother in disposition and in face that whoever saw one saw the other they were both so disagreeable and so proud that nobody could endure them the younger was the image of her dead father she was sweet and kind-hearted besides being very beautiful while her mother loved the elder daughter to distraction she hated the younger the poor child had to eat in the kitchen and work 
day and night, and twice every day she had to walk several miles to a distant fountain to fetch home a large pitcher of water. One morning, while she was resting beside the fountain, a poor woman passing by stopped and asked her for a drink. "'Yes, indeed,' said the obliging young girl, and immediately dipping her pitcher, she filled it where the water was coldest, and held it carefully up so that the woman might easily drink from it. When the woman had finished drinking, she said, "'You are so beautiful, so good, and so kind, that I must bestow a gift upon you. For every word that you speak, there shall fall from your lips either a flower or a jewel.' now the woman was not really a poor peasant but a fairy who had taken that form in order to find how kind-hearted the young girl was she then vanished as soon as the daughter arrived home her mother scolded her for being absent so long i beg your pardon my mother for being gone such a long time answered the girl and as she spoke there fell from her lips three roses, three lilies, three pearls, and three large diamonds. "'What do I see?' exclaimed the, her mother in amazement. "'Where did you get them, my child?' It was the first time in her life that she had ever called her my child. "'I do believe those jewels came from your mouth.' The poor girl told her, in a few words what had happened, and while she was talking a shower of blossoms and gems fell to the ground. "'Truly,' exclaimed the mother, "'I must send my darling there. Look,' called she to the elder daughter, "'come see what comes out of your sister's mouth. Would you not be glad to have the same fairy gifts? You have only to go and draw some water from the fountain when a poor woman asks for a drink and give it to her very politely.' "'It would certainly look fine for me to carry a great pitcher to the fountain,' answered the elder daughter angrily. "'I wish you to go there at once,' said her mother. So the girl went, but grumbling. She took the prettiest silver pitcher that there was in the house, and she was no sooner arrived at the fountain when she saw, stepping out of the wood, a magnificent lady, attired in rich robes, who approached the girl and asked her for a drink. It was the same fairy who had appeared to her sister, but who had taken the form of a princess in order to find out how rude the girl would be. "'Oh, indeed,' answered the insolent girl. "'Do you think that I am come here on purpose to give you a drink? I suppose you think that I brought a silver pitcher expressly to draw water for you? Draw the water yourself, my fine lady.' "'You are rude,' replied the fairy, without becoming the least angry. "'Since you are so utterly disobliging, I bestow on you a gift. "'It is this. "'For every word you speak there shall fall from your mouth "'either a viper or a toad.' "'Then the fairy vanished. "'When her mother saw the girl returning, she cried out, "'Well, my daughter!' "'Well, my mother,' snapped the hateful girl, "'and as she spoke there sprang from her mouth two snakes and one toad.' what do i see shrieked her mother your sister is the cause of this and she shall pay for it and she rushed to beat the poor child who fled into the neighbouring wood the son of the king was returning from the chase and met her as she was running away seeing how beautiful she was he asked her why she was there alone and why she wept ah sir she said it is because my mother has driven me from home the king's son, seeing five or six pearls and as many diamonds fall from her lips, begged her to explain how such a marvel could be. When she told him about the fairy's gift, he thought that such a wedding portion was more than he could expect with the princess, so he led the girl to his palace and married her. As for the sister, she made herself so hated and so many vipers and toads sprung from her mouth that at last her mother drove her from home and after having been refused shelter by all the neighbors she died in a dark corner of the wood end of chapter sixty one toads and diamonds by charles perrault recording by thomas rose Chapter sixty two 
of the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by phone the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud by francis jenkins olcott blanche and rose once upon a time there was a poor widow who had two charming daughters she named the elder blanche and the younger rose because they had the most beautiful complexions in the world one day while the woman sat spinning at the door of her cottage she saw a poor bent old woman hobbling by on a crutch she pitied her and said you are very tired sit down a minute and rest then she called her daughters to fetch a chair they both hastened but rose ran faster than her sister and brought it will you not have a drink asked the mother kindly indeed i will replied the old woman and it seems to me that i could eat a morsel too if you will give me something to strengthen me i will gladly give you all that i have said the mother but as i am poor it will not be much then she bade her daughters wait on the old woman who had seated herself at the table she told blanche to go and pick some plums from the plum tree that blanche herself had planted and of which she was very proud but instead of obeying her mother pleasantly she went away grumbling and thinking what a shame that i have taken such care of my tree just for this greedy old woman however she did not dare refuse to fetch some plums and she brought them with a very bad grace and evidently much against her will and you rose said the mother you have no fruits to give this good lady for your grapes are not yet ripe that is true answered rose but i hear my hen cackling she has just laid an egg and i will give that with all my heart and without allowing the old woman time to speak rose ran out to seek the egg but when she came back the old woman had disappeared and in her place stood the most beautiful lady a fairy good woman said she to the mother i am about to reward your two daughters as they deserve the elder shall become a great queen and the younger shall be a farmer's wife then the lady waved a wand and in a twinkling the little cottage was changed into a pretty farmhouse surrounded by a flourishing farm this is your wedding portion said she to rose i know i am giving to each of you what you like best so saying the fairy disappeared leaving the mother and daughter speechless with surprise and joy they were delighted with the spotlessness of all the furniture the chairs were of wood but they were so well polished that they shone like mirrors the beds were covered with linen as white as snow in the stables there were twenty sheep as many lambs four oxen four cows and in the yard were chickens ducks and pigeons there was also a pretty garden full of fruits and flowers blanche saw without jealousy all that the fairy had given her sister she was taken up with the thought of the delightful time she should have when she became a queen just then a party of royal hunters passed by and while she stood in the door to look at them she appeared so wonderfully beautiful in the eyes of the king that he determined to marry her after she became queen she said to rose i do not wish you to be a farmer's wife come with me sister and i will wed you to a great lord i am much obliged to you my sister answered rose but i am used to the country and wish always to remain here during the first months of her marriage queen blanche was so occupied with fine clothes balls and the theatre that she thought of nothing else but afterward she became accustomed to the gay doings of the court and nothing amused her on the contrary she had many troubles at first the courtiers paid her great deference but she knew that when she was not present they said to each other see how this little peasant puts on the airs of a fine lady the king must have very low taste to choose such a wife talk like this came to the king and he began to think that he had made a mistake in marrying blanche so he ceased to love her and neglected her sadly when the courtiers saw this they no longer did her honour she had not one true friend to whom she might confide her sorrows she always had a doctor near her who examined her food and took away everything she liked they put no salt in her soups she was forbidden to walk when she wished to in a word she was interfered with from morning to night the king took her children from her and gave them in charge of governesses who brought them up badly 
but the queen dared not say a word poor blanche she was dying of grief she became so thin that everybody pitied her she had not seen her sister for several years because she thought that it would disgrace the queen to visit a farmer's wife but now feeling herself so unhappy she asked the king's permission to pass a few days in the country he gladly gave his consent for he was delighted to be rid of her when she arrived in the evening at the home of rose a band of shepherds and shepherdesses were dancing gaily on the grass there was a time sighed blanche when i amused myself like these simple people then there was no one to prevent it while she was thinking thus her sister ran to embrace her looking so happy and plump that blanche could not help weeping as she gazed at her rose had married a young farmer who loved her dearly and together they managed the farm that was the fairy's marriage portion rose had not many servants but those she had she treated so kindly that they were as devoted to her as if they were her children her neighbours too were so fond of her that they were always trying to show it she had not much money but she had no need of it for her farm produced wheat wine and oil her flock furnished milk and she made butter and cheese she spun the wool of her sheep into clothing for her household all of whom enjoyed the best of health when the day's work was done the whole family amused themselves with games music and dancing alas cried queen blanche the fairy made me but a sad gift when she gave me a crown people do not find happiness in magnificent palaces but in the simple joys and labour of the country as she finished speaking the fairy herself appeared before her i did not intend to reward you by making you a queen she said but to punish you because you gave your plums with such bad grace in order to be truly happy it is necessary to possess like your sister only those things that are simple and joyful and not to wish for more ah oh, madame cried blanche you are sufficiently avenged pray put an end to my misery it is ended replied the fairy even now the king who has ceased to love you is sending his officers to forbid your returning to the palace all happened as the fairy had said and blanche passed the rest of her life with rose she was happy and contented never even thinking of the royal court except when she thanked the fairy for taking her from it and bringing her back to the pretty farm and to her dear sister madame le prince de beaumont End of chapter 62chapter sixty three of the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by phone the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud by francis jenkins alcott the enchanted watch there once lived a gay young girl named fanny who never knew what time it was did she care that i cannot say and it is impossible for me to tell you how often she kept her father waiting and caused him to be late for his appointments and such a kind father as he was to fanny for she was his only child and he loved her very much indeed he loved her so much that he overlooked her faults when he should have reproved them whole half hours she used to keep the carriage waiting in front of the door while she prinked before her mirror and because she was never prompt every one called her miss tardy yet after keeping people waiting she would excuse herself in the sweetest manner possible and blame herself for thoughtlessness one day her old godmother wrote that she was coming the next morning to lunch with fanny at noon she was a fairy so celebrated for her promptness that people called her the fairy prompt of which name she was very proud with her noon was not ten minutes after twelve nor ten minutes before twelve but it was exactly twelve o'clock so the next morning at the first stroke of twelve she set her foot on the bottom step of fanny's house and as the last stroke died away she entered the dining-room the table was beautifully laid and all was ready but fanny was not there indeed miss tardy had forgotten all about her godmother and was calling on a friend she was trying on her friend's beautiful new clothes and having such a fine time that the godmother was utterly forgotten 
as if she had never been in the world but at last hunger reminded fanny of luncheon and she hurried home the servants informed her that her godmother had arrived but as fanny's shoes pinched her she rushed to her room and put on a pretty little pair of slippers then as her street clothes were not suitable for slippers she changed her dress for a becoming house gown by this time it was two o'clock she found her godmother asleep in a comfortable chair such as is not made any more and i think she was snoring a little she awoke as fanny opened the door hurriedly my dear godmother said she i am so sorry so ashamed i am indeed a thoughtless creature to keep you waiting this way that is all right said the godmother who was very kind and indulgent to fanny i have slept a little while waiting for you that will do me no harm what time is it oh please do not ask me begged fanny you will make me die with shame and like a playful child she ran and stood in front of the clock but her fairy godmother who had good eyes saw that the hand had passed two o'clock the dinner as you may well imagine was overdone but the fairy who really loved her goddaughter took it all as good-naturedly as possible and made many gay jokes as she tried to eat the burnt roasts and the scorched creams it was soon four o'clock and fanny's father hurriedly entered the drawing-room where she was chatting with her godmother well fanny he cried are you ready are you ready then he started back when he saw his daughter in her pretty pink and blue house-gown stretched indolently on a sofa her feet to the fire while she daintily sipped her coffee what exclaimed her father have you forgotten that you were to be ready at four o'clock do you not see my godmother with me papa said fanny reproachfully pardon me madame said the father turning to the fairy and bowing although his face was red with anger excuse my rudeness but my daughter will cause me to die with grief and what has the poor child done asked the godmother judge for yourself said he prince randolph has invited us to his villa fanny is to sing for his guests they are all assembled and expecting her the prince has sent his carriage which is now waiting before the door but papa said fanny cannot you go without me you know that cannot be child said her father sadly it is you who are invited and it is your fine voice that the prince wishes for his musicale he will now be offended for ever since you cannot go in this dress calm yourself my good sir said the godmother seeing fanny's confusion it is because of me that this dear little one has forgotten you it is for me to repair this evil so saying she passed her hand over the unfortunate house gown and it was instantly transformed into the most ravishing robe embroidered with gold and pearls fanny who was naturally very pretty shone like a star in this brilliant costume wait a minute said the fairy to the impatient father who was already leading his daughter away let me finish my work and she put around the neck of her goddaughter a magnificent golden chain at the end of which hung an exquisite little watch the size of a locket and all of chased gold studded with diamonds now little one said she kissing the forehead of the spoiled child here is something that will aid your naughty memory with this you will never again forget an engagement be sure to come home by ten o'clock oh yes indeed said fanny kissing her godmother joyfully it is necessary to say here that it was the fairy prompt who invented watches in her youth but hers were not like those sold nowadays in the shops there was a magic virtue in each watch for when the hour of an engagement arrived it made so loud a ticking that the owner of it had no peace until he kept his engagement so it happened that while fanny was listening to the praises of the prince and his guests who were saying that she had the most delightful voice in the world she heard a gentle sound but very distinct tick 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 it is ten o'clock exclaimed fanny joyously to her father oh my dear good little watch that my godmother gave me it has told me so we must hurry home her father who was very much pleased because she had charmed the prince and his guests with her sweet voice said as they drove away my dear child to-morrow i am going to take you to the finest jeweller in town 
and buy for you the bracelet of antique cameos that you have been begging me for at what time do you wish to go at ten o'clock oh no cried fanny her eyes sparkling with delight at nine o'clock please ever since i saw the bracelet i have been dying to possess it very good at nine o'clock then and what shall we do with the rest of our morning at exactly ten i am to go to the dressmakers to order some new gowns said fanny but may we not lunch together at eleven just as you say dear little nightingale answered her father affectionately and order all the gowns and furbelows you wish for the plumage should match the warbling and since it suits you i will meet you promptly at eleven for at twelve i have an important business engagement at eleven o'clock then dear papa said fanny but do not forget to return in time this evening to escort me to the baron's ball don't worry said her father smiling for nothing in the world would i make a pearl of a daughter like you wait for an escort the next morning fanny rose early and dressed more rapidly than usual and was ready waiting for her father at nine they drove to the jeweller's how her eyes sparkled as her father clasped the cameo bracelet on her arm but the jeweller who hoped to sell fanny a necklace as well took from his showcase such beautiful colours of pearls rubies amethysts and other gems and precious stones that she forgot how the time was flying tick 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 thank you dear watch for warning me said fanny gaily but the dressmaker must wait tick 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 you insupportable thing cried she and taking the watch from her neck she handed it to her father saying i beg you dear papa to put this in your pocket it is very annoying he took the watch and seeing a friend on the street went to the door to speak with him talk 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 the watch raised its voice so that fanny should hear it the people in the shop all asked where the noise came from and her father mortified said good-bye to his friend gave back the watch to fanny and hurried her into the carriage she was soon at the dressmaker's and her ill-humour passed as she ordered a dress of pink brocade trimmed with rich lace and a robe of garnet velvet embroidered with gold threads and a cloak of silver cloth trimmed with pearls she was not yet through when she glanced at the clock and saw that it was eleven oh thought she that horrid watch is going to disturb me again but i'll finish my ordering talk 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 the dressmaker turned her head what's that miss she exclaimed with fright it is nothing let us go on said miss tardy talk 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 louder than before it is thieves it is thieves cried the dressmaker it is nothing i tell you unfold this gown talk 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 louder and louder and the poor dressmaker half dead with fright was in such a state that she could show no more clothes and fanny put on her hat and coat and hurried away to the restaurant where she found her father walking nervously up and down ah how thoughtful of you dear child to be prompt he said as he led her to a table and the delicious food soon made her forget her annoyance when fanny returned home she was so fatigued that she put on a charming wrapper and lay down to rest then she remembered that she had an engagement to see a poor man at two o'clock whose want she had promised to relieve she took the fatal watch from her neck and giving it to the maid said take this and carry it to the cellar so that i may be rid of it two o'clock struck and the poor old man who had had nothing to eat for three days presented himself the maid told him that miss fanny was sleeping and would not see him with tears streaming down his cheeks he bowed humbly and was turning away when everybody in the house jumped to the ceiling bath 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 it was like so many shots from a pistol the neighbors commenced screaming the servants ran frantically to and fro fanny sprang up from her couch bath 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 it must be that wretched watch cried she bath 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 yes yes i am coming i am coming 
and she hurried to the cellar and picking up the watch returned to her room in silence then she called the poor old man fed him and comforted him and sent him away with a full purse evening arrived and fanny all dressed for the baron's ball shone more beautifully than ever in a magnificent gown and just as her father was leading her to the carriage a clumsy wagon drove up and an old countrywoman descended from it crying out that she must see her dear child her fanny just once more before she died it was fanny's old nurse who had come all the way from her village miles distant to hold her dear child in her arms when she saw that fanny was ready to go out she screamed loudly and would have made herself ill if fanny had not embraced her tenderly and promised to return before midnight on the strength of this promise the old woman grew calm and fanny and her father went away to the ball but as the carriage drove through the streets fanny regretted her promise and slipping her little hand under her cloak she loosened the fatal watch and flung it into a deep ditch at last at last she said to herself with a sigh of relief midnight sounded and found her breathlessly twirling around in the dance her eyes sparkling and her cheeks glowing boom 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 the orchestra stopped suddenly the thunderclaps for so they seemed to be continued to follow each other without interruption boom 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 all the city was awake women cried out that the end of the world was come the unfortunate fanny knew in a minute what it was fright seized her and she lost her head instead of returning home quietly which would have put an end to the horrible racket she ran out into the street and wild with fright hastened with all speed to the spot where she had thrown the watch boom 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 the houses were lighted the amazed people thrust their head out the windows and all that they saw was a young girl running through the streets her neck and head bare and her ball gown flying in the wind boom 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 every stroke was louder and more fearful the firemen came hurrying up to see if there was a fire and one of them held his lantern under fanny's nose and cried out why it is little miss tardy she has doubtless lost the time and is hunting for it ha <laughs> ha meanwhile fanny ran on and arrived breathlessly at the ditch into which she had flung the watch guided by its thunderous blows she quickly laid her fingers on it in a fury she was about to dash it against the stone when she felt a hand on her arm it was a fairy godmother who in gentle tones of reproach said what are you doing my child you can never succeed then she took the watch from fanny which instantly became quiet and passed the chain around the neck of her goddaughter who was trembling with penitence and shame neither violence nor trickery said her godmother have any power over my gift to you all you can do is to take it and obey and then you will find yourself happy at the same moment miss tardy felt herself being transported through the air and found herself once more in her own room holding the hand of her old nurse who was weeping with tenderness and joy i have no need to tell you that fanny never again attempted to disobey the protecting tyrant that she wore around her neck and as the watch no longer had to warn her with its loud ticking she learned in time to enjoy sacrificing her whims to her duty jean massey adapted end of section sixty three Chapter sixty four Queen Mab by Francis Jenkins Oldcott read for LibriVox dot org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. A little fairy comes at night. Her eyes are blue, her hair is brown, with silver spots upon her wings, and from the moon she flutters down. She has a little silver wand and when a good child goes to bed she waves her wand from right to left and makes a circle round its head and then it dreams of pleasant things of fountains filled with fairy fish and trees that bear delicious fruit and bow their branches at a wish of arbors filled with dainty scents from lovely flowers that never fade 
bright flies that glitter in the sun and glowworms shining in the shade and talking birds with gifted tongues for singing songs and telling tales and pretty dwarfs to show the way through fairy hills and fairy dales but when a bad child goes to bed from left to right she weaves her rings and then it dreams all through the night of only ugly horrid things then wicked children wake and weep and wish the long black gloom away but good ones love the dark and find the night as pleasant as the day thomas hood condensed end of poem this recording is in the public domain section 65 fairy adventures by francis jenkins olcott read for LibriVox.org by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc a little knight and a little maid met on the rim of fairy land a rippling stream betwixt them played the little knight reached out his hand and said now may i cross to you or will you come across to me out spoke the little maiden true sir knight nor this nor that can be for i am here white flowers to sow that little maidens far behind or wandering on the plains below their pathway up the hill may find and you are there good work to do to clear the brambles from the way that little knights who follow you may not upon the mountain stray lucy larcom end of poem this recording is in the public domain chapter 66 of the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud by francis jenkins olcott chapter 66 fairy do nothing and giant snap em up in the days of yore there lived a very idle greedy naughty boy such as we never hear of in these times his name was master no book the young gentleman hated lessons like mustard both of which brought tears to his eyes and during school hours he sat gazing at his books pretending to be busy while he considered where he could get the nicest pies pastries ices and jellies he smacked his lips at the very thought of them whenever master no book spoke it was to ask for a piece of cake or an apple or a bit of plum pudding indeed very frequently when he did not get permission to eat the goodies this naughty glutton helped himself without leave one afternoon master no book having played truant from school was lolling on his mamma's best sofa with his leather boots tucked up on the satin cushions and nothing to do but to suck a few oranges and nothing to think of but how much sugar to put into them when suddenly an event took place which filled him with astonishment a sound of soft music stole into the room becoming louder and louder the longer he listened till at length a large hole burst open in the wall of the room and there stepped into his presence two magnificent fairies just arrived from their castles in the air to pay him a visit they had travelled all the way on purpose to talk with master no book the fairy do nothing was gorgeously dressed in a wreath of flames around her head a robe of gold tissue a necklace of rubies and a bouquet of glittering diamonds in her hand her teeth were gold her hair was the most brilliant purple and her eyes were green in fact she was a most fine and fashionable fairy the fairy teach all who followed next 
was simply dressed in white muslin with bunches of natural flowers in her brown hair, and she carried a few neat small books, which made Master No Book shudder. The two fairies now informed him that they very often invited large parties of children to spend some time in their palaces. Therefore they had now come to invite Master No Book but as they lived in opposite directions he would have to choose which he would visit first. "'In my house,' said the fairy Teach-All, speaking with a very sweet smile and a soft, pleasing voice, "'my young friends rise at seven every morning and amuse themselves with working in a beautiful garden of flowers, raising fruits of all kinds, visiting the poor, playing together, and learning to know the world they live in, and how to fulfill the purpose for which they have been brought into it. In short, all our amusements tend to some useful object, and you will grow wiser, better, and happier every day you remain in the Palace of Knowledge. But in the castle needless where I live, interrupted the fairy do-nothing, rudely pushing her companion aside, we never think of working, no one is ever asked a question, we lead the most fashionable life imaginable. Each of my visitors sits with his back to as many of the company as possible, and whenever he can he sits in the most comfortable chair. If he takes the trouble to wish for anything, he gets it clothes are provided of the most magnificent kinds which go on by themselves without buttons or strings delicious dishes are served smoking hot under his nose at all hours while any rain that falls is of lemonade chocolate and cider and in winter it generally snows ice cream and tutti frutti for an hour during the forenoon Nobody need be told which fairy Master No Book preferred, and quite charmed at his new fortune in receiving such a delightful invitation, he eagerly gave his hand to his splendid new acquaintance, who promised him so much pleasure and ease. He gladly proceeded with her in a carriage lined with velvet, stuffed with downy pillows, and drawn by milk-white swans to that magnificent residence, Castle Needless which was lighted by a thousand windows during the day and by a million lamps at night. Here Master No Book enjoyed a constant holiday and a continual feast. A beautiful lady, covered with jewels, was ready to tell him stories from morning till night. Servants waited to pick up his playthings if they fell, and to draw out his purse or pocket-handkerchief when he wished to use them. Thus Master No Book lay dozing for hours and days on richly embroidered cushions, never stirring from his place in the garden, but admiring the view of trees covered with the richest burnt almonds, the grottoes of sugar candy, a fountain of lemonade, and a bright clear pond filled with goldfish that let themselves be caught. Nothing could be more complete. Yet, strange to say, Master No Book did not seem particularly happy. Every day he became more peevish. No sweetmeats were worth the trouble of eating, no game was pleasant to play, and he wished that it were possible to sleep all day, as well as night. Not a hundred miles from the fairy Do-Nothing's palace there lived a cruel monster called the Giant snap em up When he stood erect, he looked like the tall steeple of a great church. He raised his head so high that he could peep over the loftiest mountains, and he was obliged to climb a ladder to comb his own hair. Every morning this prodigiously great giant walked round the world before breakfast, looking for something to eat. He lived in fine style, and his dinners were most magnificent, consisting of an elephant roasted whole, ostrich patties, a tiger smothered in onions, stewed lions, and whale soup. But for a side dish, his favorite of all consisted of little boys, as fat as possible, fried in crumbs of bread with plenty of pepper and salt. No children were so well fed or in such good condition for eating as those in the fairy Do-Nothing's garden, who was a particular friend of the giant snap em up She oftentimes laughingly said that she gave him permission to help himself whenever he pleased to as many of her visitors as he chose, 
and in return for such civility the giant often invited her to dinner one day when master no book felt even more lazy more idle more miserable than ever he lay beside a perfect mountain of toys and cakes wondering what to wish for next and hating the very sight of everything and everybody at last he gave so loud a yawn of weariness and disgust and he sighed so deeply that the giant snap em up heard the sounds as he passed along the road before breakfast instantly he stepped into the garden to see what was the matter on observing a large fat overgrown boy as round as a dumpling lying on a bed of roses he gave a cry of delight followed by a gigantic peal of laughter which was heard three miles off picking up master no book between his finger and thumb with a pinch that nearly broke his ribs he carried him rapidly toward his own castle while the fairy do nothing laughingly shook her head as he passed saying that little man does me great credit he has been fed only for a week and is as fat already as a prize ox what a dainty morsel he will be when do you dine my friend snap em up in case i should have time to look in upon you on reaching home the giant immediately hung master no book by the hair of his head on a prodigious hook in the larder and then he went away to look for more little boys there in torture of mind and body like a fish on a hook the wretched master no book began to reflect seriously on his former ways and consider what a happy home he might have had if he had been satisfied to go to school and study with the other boys in the midst of these sad reflections master no book's attention was attracted by the sound of many voices laughing talking and singing which caused him to turn his eyes and look out of the larder window for the first time he observed that the fairy teach-all's garden lay upon a beautiful sloping bank not far away there a crowd of merry noisy rosy-cheeked boys were busily employed and seemed happier than the day was long poor master no book watched them envying the enjoyment with which they raked the flower borders gathered fruit carried baskets of vegetables to the poor worked with carpenter's tools drew pictures shot with bows and arrows and played ball then they sat in sunny arbors learning their lessons till the dinner bell having been rung the whole party sat down to a feast of roast meat apple pie and other wholesome things the fairy teach-all presided and helped her guests to as much as was good for them large tears rolled down the cheeks of master no book while watching this scene and remembering that if he had known what was best for him he might have been as happy as the happiest of these excellent boys instead of being about to suffer a most miserable death now as the giant snap em up wished a nice dish of fried boys for dinner and as there was plenty of time he seized a large basket in his hand and set off at a rapid pace toward the fairy teach-all's garden it was very seldom that snap em up ventured to forage there as he had never once succeeded in carrying off a single captive from that garden it was so well fortified and so bravely defended but on this occasion being desperately hungry he felt bold as a lion and walked with outstretched hands straight toward the fairy teach-all's dinner-table taking such huge strides that he seemed almost to trample on himself a cry of consternation arose the minute this tremendous giant appeared and as usual as when on such occasions he had made the same attempt before a dreadful battle took place fifty active little boys flew upon the enemy with their dinner knives and like a nest of hornets stung him in every direction till he roared with pain and would have run away but the fairy teach-all rushed forward and cut off his head with the carving knife if a great mountain had fallen to the earth it would have seemed like nothing in comparison with the giant snap em up who crushed houses to powder under him but the greatest event which occurred was the death of the fairy do-nothing who had been looking on at this battle and who was too lazy to run away 
when the giant fell his sword came with so violent a stroke on her head that she instantly expired the fairy teach-all seeing the enemy dead hastened to the giant's castle and lost no time in liberating master no book from his hook in the larder from this very hour master no book became the most diligent active happy boy in the fairy teach-all's garden and on returning home a few months afterward he astonished all his teachers at school by his wisdom and studiousness he scarcely ever stirred without a book in his hand never lay on a sofa again and preferred a three-legged stool to a comfortable chair with a back he detested holidays and never ate a morsel of food till he had worked very hard and got an appetite when he grew up he was known as sir timothy bluestocking and though generally very good-natured and agreeable sir timothy was occasionally to be seen in a violent passion laying about him with his walking-stick and beating little boys within an inch of their lives it invariably appeared that he had found them to be lazy idle or greedy by catherine sinclair end of chapter sixty six recording by Thomas Rose Chapter 67 of the Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. The Book of Elves and Fairies for Storytelling and Reading Aloud by francis jenkins olcott timothy tuttle and the little imps timothy tuttle esq was reclining on his soft comfortable sofa the gaslight flashed brilliantly over the rich rug and rosewood furniture and fell softly on the velvet seated chairs and heavy curtains it was a mild evening in june and the cool air came refreshingly in while the bright light flashed gaily out the windows timothy tuttle esq one of the richest merchants in the city was reposing after the fatigues of the day he was thinking how very good and respectable he was and of his success in life of his great wealth and especially of his ships now in the china seas which were bringing him even more wealth then he thought of his plans for a fine new mansion and how he would now be able to purchase many costly things for his home very soon he grew weary and fell asleep suddenly he awoke and heard something moving over the rug and turning his head to see what it was beheld a dozen or more of the strangest little creatures capering about they were like little imps in human form but winged and not higher than timothy's knee they were coal black from head to foot and were moving around with grace and agility timothy tuttle was a brave man but he was very much startled to see this unexpected sight for as soon as the little imps perceived that he was awake they began to bow to him in quick succession more and more rapidly and all the time grinning and showing their white teeth from ear to ear then timothy tuttle heard something squeak close to his head and saw one of the little creatures sitting on the arm of the sofa and mowing at him don't be afraid timothy it's only i it squeaked who on earth are you asked timothy and what do you want this question seemed to amuse all the little fellows hugely for they began to bow again grinning and capering in fine style and crying out how do you do timothy we are very glad to see you timothy don't be afraid timothy we're all here i am glad of that exclaimed timothy i'm glad that there are no more of you plenty more plenty more timothy they cried laughing and holding their sides but we'll do timothy we'll do oh yes we'll do we'll do timothy tuttle was no coward 
but he could not help feeling somewhat frightened as he looked at their antics and he gazed around to see where they could have come in the door was locked and only the window was open what do you want go away go away he cried in a husky voice the little imps grinned all the more delighted to see you timothy flattering reception timothy we'll be happy to stay timothy and with that they began to bow again with great politeness timothy looked about for some weapon of defence but saw nothing within reach what do you want he demanded again want you timothy must come with us timothy where to he demanded at that all the little imps pointed over their shoulders with their thumbs to the open window timothy reflected that as he was in the second story of the house any attempt to go out by the window without wings would be preposterous he drew his hand across his eyes to make sure that he was not asleep then he looked again and there were all the little imps bowing more politely than ever he seized a pillow and was about to throw it at them when they flew at him dragged the pillow out of his hands overpowered him and picking him up by the arms and legs flew out of the window carrying him off bodily how far he was carried timothy tuttle never knew but it seemed to him a very long distance when he found himself again at liberty he was lying on the bare ground in the cold moonlight he sprang up and saw all the little imps standing in a circle around him bowing and nodding with great good humour he looked about he found himself on an open plain surrounded by forests nothing was in sight except a very large gothic building in the centre of the plain it was old but a larger and more magnificent building timothy had never seen its pointed roof rose to the skies and stained glass windows adorned its grey stone walls the turrets and towers were beautifully carved and the walls were hung here and there with green ivy but the building was falling into decay some of the windows were broken and some of the stones crumbling to ruin a few of the arches were fallen and the roof threatened to cave in timothy tuttle turned from surveying this building to look at his grinning companions you're wanted timothy cried one where he asked hoarsely they all pointed over their shoulders with their thumbs at the great door of the building but what if i will not go he asked in as cool and determined a voice as he could assume at this all the little imps began to caper about in great glee singing mortals rash who disobey little imps will bear away if they still refuse to go if they dare to answer no take a pin and stick it in at that instant timothy tuttle felt a sharp pain in one of his legs and he could not help crying out he knew that there was nothing to do but to obey so he turned and walked toward the building while the quick patter of tiny feet and the flutter of wings told him that the little imps were close behind only once did he turn his head and his ears were greeted with oh yes timothy we're all here when timothy had entered the door he found that the interior of the building was one great room around its sides were galleries rising tier above tier and under the galleries were recesses and alcoves still it was all one room from the centre of the arched ceiling hung a splendid chandelier with a thousand lamps but most of the lights were extinguished and the few that were burning flickered and smoked so badly that the building was dimly lighted when timothy first entered his ears were filled with a hissing and fluttering sound and after he had been there long enough to become used to the dim light he saw that the whole building was full of just such little imps as had brought him hither they were flying up and down and flitting to and fro and seemed very busy looking up he saw four or five large windows through which some appeared to fly away 
while others would dart through into the building with great swiftness just as bees come and go from the hive but the most astonishing part of it all was their extraordinary politeness to timothy and the grinning that showed on all sides as he entered now as we have said before timothy tuttle was no coward and stepping up to one of the little imps who had just flown in he said you seem to know me oh yes timothy replied the little fellow nodding violently yes i know you i know you well where do you all go to out those windows and where do you come from oh i've just been to china timothy looked as if he did not believe him yes i've just been to china seas on board your ships and i have been counting your wealth and the little wretch winked fast and knowingly timothy was dumb he remembered what he had been thinking when he fell asleep his grinning companion left him and he wandered about the great edifice where he saw a large number of little imps busily at work some were painting the wall with small brushes it was amazing to see how rapidly they could sketch a picture timothy watched them for a moment and fairly held his breath when he saw one by one past scenes of his own life start out upon the wall many of the scenes that he had thought that no one knew of but himself but here one or another of his deeds good and bad was drawn to the very life upon the wall and as they worked the little fellows grinned and sang but timothy could not understand what they said timothy turned away from these grinning little creatures and moved to where another group were sketching other pictures he was almost afraid to look at the pictures but when he did so he saw that the painters were making designs too ugly and horrid to look at but timothy was perplexed for of all the pictures there was none that he did not think he had seen somewhere before and these little imps were singing the same song that the others were singing and timothy thought that he caught the refrain bad little sad little mad little thoughts here he turned to look into the recesses and alcoves under the galleries not all the inhabitants of the edifice were like the little creatures who had brought him hither oh no in the shadows of the great pillars there lurked and crawled great slimy things that made one shudder to see enormous spiders larger than any timothy had ever dreamed of ran swiftly across the floor centipedes and lizards clung to the mouldy walls and cold slippery serpents glided noiselessly along occasionally he came upon huge shapeless creatures who lay curled upon the floor staring at him with watery eyes timothy hastily picked his way out into the light again here he found other groups of painters one group was using brighter colors and blending them beautifully but he could scarcely believe his own eyes when he saw the picture of the fine mansion he was planning and the images of a thousand other things he had wished and hoped for but the painters in the next room were acting very strangely they touched their brushes to the wall hastily and tremblingly glancing over their shoulders as if in terror and though their pictures did not assume any definite form timothy felt most uneasy there he saw the dim outline of another world of which he had heard but had forgotten to think of for many years meanwhile timothy had reached the upper end of the room and found himself close to a great curtain tightly drawn on either side of it he beheld a marble basin one of the basins had evidently contained a fountain but it was now half choked with mud and only a little water oozed out of it on looking into the other he was astonished to find it full of liquid fire just then he heard behind the curtain the sound as of a mighty rushing wind and at the same moment the two fountains boiled up and cast out their dirt and this they continued to do until each basin was brimming full one of pure water and the other of pure fire the little imps too heard the sound at first they were awed and hushed then they began to fly about in confusion until timothy was bewildered by the noise and movement suddenly the curtain was parted 
and timothy saw a stately lady seated upon a throne in a noble arched recess her head was thrown back her eyes flashed and in her hand she held a scourge every thong of which seemed to writhe and twist and end in little snappers of fire at the sight of this scourge and the frown on the lady's face all the little imps began to howl dismally the lady arose and came down from her throne into the centre of the room and the little imps fled before her but they could not escape seizing the first one she met she plunged him several times into the basin of water then taking him out she carried him kicking and quivering to the other basin and plunged him into the fire timothy stood horror-stricken he leaned against a pillar to support himself but what was his astonishment to see the lady take the little fellow out of the basin and release him and he ran away unharmed but a strange thing had happened the little imp was no longer so black and instead of grinning maliciously he was now smiling as pleasantly as possible the lady seized every little imp in the room in the same manner and plunged him into both basins then she collected troops of the imps and drove them before her with the fiery scourge she made them begin to scrape the dirt off the floor and down from the walls to repair the broken places in the roof and to polish the rusty and musty spots and all the rubbish she made them throw into the basin full of pure fire sometimes two or three little imps would carry one of the great slimy reptiles and drop him in and all those thus dropped into the fire never came out again and as the little imps worked they broke into a song all the rubbish tither take little whip will make us ache tug tug the big bug spider follow and slimy thing in the fire light they fling rub rub off the rust sweep sweep away the dust sparkle sparkle precious stone pearly roof an ivory throne oh dear 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 hear the fiery lashes crack on each little lazy back hear the glowing basin boil little imps must burn or toil timothy watched and listened until he became very weary then he stretched himself out on the floor and fell asleep when he awoke he found himself lying in a dazzling light how long he had been asleep he did not know he sprang to his feet with an agility and ease that he had never felt before he looked about him there was still the same great room the same chandelier with its thousand lamps and the same pattering of little feet and rustling of wings but oh how changed how changed the arched roof was composed of transparent pearl delicately carved and fretted with lines of brilliant rose diamonds pendants hung from the arches formed of great diamonds and pearls cut into exquisite shapes the walls were of ruby and topaz and sparkled with mosaics of precious gems representing scenes more beautiful than any ever seen on earth the huge pillars were of jasper and around them was twined the graceful immortal amaranth the floor was of coloured marble inlaid with onyx and amethyst in the noble recess at the end of the room sat the lady on a throne carved from ivory and studded with diamonds her scourge and frown had disappeared and from her smiling countenance shone a divine beauty the chandelier every lamp of which was now pouring out a silver light sent a glowing radiance into the farthest corners and recesses under the galleries and revealed no signs of stain or shadow the basins threw high their spray of sparkling water and pure fire looking like fountains of liquid light which fell back again with the softest music but the greatest change of all was in the little imps they were each and all of a pure transparency of white than anything timothy had ever conceived and there was not one upon whose face did not play a smile of joy some of them were working harder than ever while others were bathing in the fountains darting and fluttering in and out of the spray they looked as light and brilliant as soap bubbles in the sun and flashing from their wings were all the colours of the rainbow indeed 
the little imps shone so brightly that timothy could scarcely look at them but while he was examining all these wonderful changes with admiration he heard a silver trumpet ring through the edifice and as its sweet notes died away among the pearl arches the little imps with myriad voices as sweet and clear as the trumpet call sang lightly we rise in the azure shies lightly we dart away lightly we roam through the boundless dome or in pathless depths we stray bright little white little light little thoughts when we would try how high we can fly when we would gaze on his brightest rays when through glory we range in colors strange lightly we turn to god there hide there abide bright little white little light little thoughts then the most amazing thing of all happened timothy tuttle esq suddenly found himself lying once more on the soft comfortable sofa in his own home the gaslight was flashing over the rich rug and rosewood furniture just as it had done when he had last seen the room he raised himself on his elbow and looked around but not one of the little imps was there indeed he could find no traces of them except the marks of their tiny black feet on the rug but from that day forward timothy was a changed man his face was no longer hard and selfish but it beamed with good and kind thoughts he no longer preferred wealth to everything else in the world he gave up the plan for his fine new mansion indeed he no longer wished for one and he spent the remainder of his days making his family and friends happy and relieving the poor and needy dr john todd adapted end of timothy tuttle and the little imps chapter sixty eight of the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud by francis jenkins olcott butterfly's diamond once upon a time there was a little fairy who was remarkable for her impatience and laziness she was called fairy butterfly because she had such splendid green wings with silver spots on them she loved dearly to be dressed in gorgeous colors and to sleep in the rich chambers of the foxgloves or to flutter over beds of fragrant mignonette in truth she was as luxurious a little fairy as the sun ever shone on so much did she like her ease that she would not gather a single dewdrop to bathe her face nor would she pick a fresh rose petal for a napkin she played all day long or slept curled up in the heart of a flower oh she was a lazy fairy when the queen of the fairies observed the faults of butterfly she resolved to help her to correct them one day she summoned the lazy one to court and said fairy butterfly we command you to go at once to the green cavern in the island of ceylon and remain there until you have fashioned a diamond more pure and brilliant than any that has ever rested on the brow of mortal or elf little butterfly bowed in silence and withdrew as soon as she was outside the green mound in which the fairy queen held her court she burst into a passionate flood of tears i shall have to watch that diamond for months and months and years and years sobbed she and every day i must turn it over with my wand so that the crystals will form evenly oh it is an endless labor to make a diamond oh i am a most wretched fairy so she sat and sobbed and murmured for several minutes then she jumped up and stamped her little feet on the ground so furiously that the blue-eyed grasses trembled i won't bear it she exclaimed i'll run away to the fairies of the air i am sure they will be so pleased with my beauty that they will feed me and i shall never need to work again as for the diamond why it is just impossible for a little fairy like me to make it then she peeped into a fountain to admire herself and saw alas 
that the splendid green of her wings had faded and the silver spots were dim for if fairies have naughty thoughts their wings always droop and their beauty fades at this sight little butterfly wept aloud with vexation and shame i suppose the old tyrant our queen thinks that now i am so ugly i'll hide myself in the green cavern in the island of ceylon but i'll let her see that i do not care about her and alas as butterfly spoke thus the silver spots disappeared entirely and her wings became a dirty brown trembling with anger the little one waved her wand and called hummingbird hummingbird come nigh come nigh and carry me off to the far blue sky in an instant a tiny hummingbird shining like a jewel alighted at her feet she sprang on its back and away they flew to the golden clouds in the west where the queen of the air fairies held her court and when the queen and all her fairies saw butterfly's dirty brown wings they waved their wands and vanished and little butterfly was left alone in the palace of the air but such a beautiful palace as it was the clouds hung around it like transparent curtains of opal the floor was paved with a rainbow thousands of gorgeous birds fluttered in the sunlight and a multitude of voices filled the place with sweet sounds butterfly fatigued by her flight through the sky and lulled by the voices lay down on a rosy cloud and fell into a gentle slumber when she awoke she saw that a tiny bird smaller than the hummingbird was building a nest beside her straw after straw shred after shred the patient little creature brought in her bill and wove together and then she flew away over hills and fields to find soft down with which to line the nest she is a foolish thing murmured butterfly how hard she works and i don't believe that she will finish it after all but soon the bird came back with her bill full of down and lined the soft warm nest so that it was fit for a fairy to sleep in butterfly peeped into it and exclaimed oh what a pretty thing immediately she heard the tinkling of a lute and a clear voice singing bit by bit the bird builds her nest she started up and the queen of the air fairies stood before her clad in a robe of azure gossamer embroidered with rainbow lights foolish butterfly said she we allow no idlers here obey your queen and go at once to the green cavern in the island of ceylon time and patience will accomplish all things go and make your diamond and then you shall be welcome here butterfly tried to tell her how very hard it was to make a diamond but the queen of the air fairies flew away touching her lute and singing bit by bit the bird builds her nest butterfly leaned her head upon her hands for a minute she began to be ashamed of being so lazy but she did not yet wish to go to the lonely green cavern and work hard so she waved her wand and called again hummingbird hummingbird come nigh come nigh and carry me back through the clear blue sky immediately the little hummingbird returned and she sprang on his back he flew down with her and she alighted near the green mound inside of which the fairy queen held her court close by the mound butterfly saw some bees working in a crystal hive wearily and sadly she watched them they left the hive dipped into flowers and carried their loads of sweet pollen back to the hive and there they built their wax combs filled with golden honey i wish thought she that i love to work as hard as the bees do but as for that diamond it is useless to think about it i should never finish it just then she heard strains of delightful music coming from the mound and a chorus of fairy voices singing little by little the bee builds its cell butterfly could have wept when she heard those familiar voices for she longed to be with her fairy sisters dancing hand in hand i will make the diamond murmured she i shall surely get it done some time and i can fly home every night and dance in the fairy ring or sleep in the flowers immediately a joyful strain of music rose on the air and she heard her sister's voices singing to the green cavern haste away sleep by night and work by day little by little the gem will grow 
till pure as sunshine it will glow alas when butterfly heard this instead of flying at once to the green cavern she began to think how hard she should have to work and how many times she must turn the diamond i never can do it thought she i will go to the queen of the ocean fairies i am sure she will let me live in her sea palace and i need never work again mournful notes came from the mound as butterfly turned toward the seashore when she reached the beach she waved her wand and called nautilus nautilus come to me and carry me through the cold green sea immediately the delicate pearly boat of the nautilus came floating over the ocean and a wave landed it at butterfly's feet she stepped in and down down under the waves she went down to the bed of the ocean to a coral grove and there was the magnificent palace of the queen of the ocean fairies its pink coral pillars were twisted into a thousand beautiful forms pearls hung in deep festoons from the arches the fan coral and the sea moss were formed into deep cool bowers and the hard sandy floor was covered with many-coloured shells but as it had been in the air so it was in the sea when the queen of the ocean fairies saw butterfly's dirty brown wings she and all her court waved their wands and disappeared and butterfly was left alone in the sea palace how beautiful it is cried she giants must have made these coral pillars as she spoke her eyes were nearly blinded by a swarm of tiny insects and she saw them rest on an unfinished coral pillar while she looked and wondered she heard a thousand shell trumpets being blown and many voices singing might by might the insect builds the coral power the sounds drew nearer and nearer and a hundred fairies standing in beautiful shells came floating through the water in the largest shell of all was their queen in a robe of wave-coloured silk spun by the ocean silkworm it was as thin as a spider's web and the border was gracefully wrought with seed pearls foolish butterfly said the queen learn to be industrious we allow no idlers at our court look at the coral pillars of my palace they were made by these swarms of little creatures labor and patience did it all and she waved her wand and the hundred shells floated away while all the fairies sang might by might the insect builds the coral bower well said butterfly sighing all creatures are busy on the earth in the air and under the water all things seem happy at their work perhaps i can learn to be so too i will make the diamond and it shall be as pure and brilliant as a sunbeam in a water drop so butterfly sought the green cavern in the island of ceylon day by day she worked as busily as the coral insects she grew cheerful and happy her wings once more became a splendid green and the silver spots were so bright that they seemed like sparks of fire never had she been so beautiful never so much loved by the little birds and flowers after seven years had passed by butterfly knelt at the feet of her queen and offered her diamond it gave light like a star and the whole fairy mound shone with its rays and to this day the fairies call it butterfly's diamond lydia marie child adapted end of chapter sixty eight chapter sixty nine of the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by mary stufflebeam the book of elves and fairies for storytelling and reading aloud by francis jenkins olcott little nibla have you seen the white mist over the river Yi in the morning? A light white mist that flies away when the sun gets hot? Yes? Then I will tell you a story about the white mist and a little girl named Alma. Little Alma lived close to the river Yi, but far, far from here. Beyond the trees and beyond the blue hills, for the Yi is a very long river. She lived with her grandmother and with six uncles, all big, tall men with long beards, 
and they always talked about wars and cattle and a great many other important things that Alma could not understand. There was no one to talk to Alma, and for Alma to talk to or play with. And when she went out of the house where all the big people were talking, she heard the cocks crowing, the dogs barking, the birds singing, the sheep bleeding, and the trees rustling their leaves over her head. And she could not understand one word of all they said. At last, having no one to play with or talk to, she sat down and began to cry. Now, it happened that near the spot where she sat there was an old black woman wearing a red shawl, who was gathering sticks for the fire, and she asked Alma why she cried. "'Because I have no one to talk to and play with,' said Alma. Then the old black woman drew a long brass pin out of her shawl, and pricked Alma's tongue with it, for she made Alma hold it out to be pricked. "'Now,' said the old woman, "'you can go and play and talk with the dogs, cats, birds, and trees, for you will understand all they say, and they will understand all you say. Alma was very glad, and ran home as fast as she could to talk to the cat. Come, cat, let us talk and play together, she said. Oh, no, said the cat. I am very busy watching a little bird, so you must go away and play with little Nibla down by the river. Then the cat ran away among the weeds and left her. The dogs also refused to play when she went to them, for they had to watch the house and bark at strangers. Then they also told her to go and play with little Nibla down by the river. Then Alma ran out and caught a little duckling, a soft little thing, that looked like a ball of yellow cotton, and said, Now, little duck, let us talk and play. But the duckling only struggled to get away, and screamed, Oh, mamma, mamma, come and take me away from Alma. Then the old duck came rushing up and said, Alma, let my child alone, and if you want to play, go and play with Nibla down by the river. A nice thing to catch my ducky in your hands. What next, I wonder? So she let the duckling go, and at last said, Yes, I will go and play with Niebla down by the river. She waited till she saw the white mist, and then ran all the way to the Yi, and stood still on the green bank close by the water with the white mist all round her. By and by she saw a beautiful little child come flying toward her in the white mist. The child came and stood on the green bank and looked at Alma. Very, very pretty she was, and she wore a white dress, whiter than milk, whiter than foam, and all embroidered with purple flowers. She had also white silk stockings and scarlet shoes, bright as scarlet verbenas. Her hair was long and fluffy and shone like gold, and round her neck she had a string of big gold beads. Then Alma said, "'Oh, beautiful little girl!' What is your name? To which the little girl answered, Nibla. Will you talk to me and play with me? said Alma. Oh, no, said Nibla. How can I play with a little girl just as you are and with bare feet? For you know, poor Alma only wore a little old frock that came down to her knees, and she had no shoes and stockings on. Then little Nibla rose up and floated away, away from the bank and down the river. And at last, when she was quite out of sight in the white mist, Alma began to cry. When it got very hot, she went and sat down, still crying under the trees. There were two very big willow trees growing near the river. By and by, the leaves rustled in the wind, and the trees began talking to each other, and Alma understood everything they said. "'Have you got any nests in your branches?' said one tree. "'Yes, one,' said the other tree." It was made by a little yellow bird, and there are five speckled eggs in it. Then the first tree said, There is a little Alma sitting in our shade. Do you know why she is crying, neighbor? The other tree answered, Yes, it is because she has no one to play with. Little Nibla by the river refused to play with her because she is not beautifully dressed. Then the first tree said, Ah, she ought to go and ask the fox for some pretty clothes to wear. The fox always keeps a great store of pretty things in her hole. Alma had listened to every word of this conversation. She remembered that a fox lived on the hillside not far off, for she had often seen it sitting in the sunshine, with its little ones playing round it and pulling their mother's tail in fun. So Alma got up and ran till she found the hole, and putting her head down it, she cried out, Fox! Fox! But the fox seemed cross, and only answered without coming out. 
Go away, Alma, and talk to little Nibla. I am busy getting dinner for my children and have no time to talk to you now. Then Alma cried, Oh, Fox, Nibla will not play with me because I have no pretty things to wear. Oh, Fox, will you give me a nice dress and shoes and stockings and a string of beads? After a while, the fox came out of its hole with a big bundle done up in a red cotton handkerchief and said, Here are the things, Alma, and I hope they will fit you. But you know, Alma, you really ought not to come at this time of day, for I am very busy just now cooking the dinner, an armadillo roasted and a couple of partridges stewed with rice, and a little omelet of turkey's eggs. I mean, plover's eggs, of course. I never touch turkey's eggs. Alma said she was very sorry to give so much trouble. Oh, never mind, said the fox. How is your grandmother? She is very well, thank you, said Alma, but she has a bad headache. I am very sorry to hear it, said the fox. Tell her to stick two fresh stock leaves on her temples and on no account to go out in the hot sun. Give her my best respects. And now run home, Alma, and try on the things. And when you are passing this way, you can bring me back the handkerchief as I always tie my face up in it when I have the toothache. Alma thanked the fox very much and ran home as fast as she could. And when the bundle was opened, she found in it a beautiful white dress embroidered with purple flowers, a pair of scarlet shoes, silk stockings, and a string of great golden beads. They all fitted her very well. And next day, when the white mist was on the yi, she dressed herself in her beautiful clothes and went down to the river. By and by, little Nibla came flying along, and when she saw Alma, she came and kissed her and took her by the hand. All the morning they played and talked together, gathering flowers and running races over the green sward. And at last, Nibla bade her goodbye and flew away, for all the white mist was floating off down the river. But every day after that, Alma found her little companion by the yi, and was very happy, for now she had someone to talk to and play with. End of chapter. Recording by Mary Stufflebeam.